All right, hello, welcome everyone. Um, we are gonna do this online this week since I am out of town. And I'm actually recording this in Orlando where I am at a veterinary conference. Um, it's the North American Veterinary Conference and um, it's actually just been renamed to the Veterinary Medical Expo or VMX. Um, and I would really recommend that uh, you know, guys, as you guys get further in your career, and you start going to continuing education events um, that you put this this event on your list of um, of places to go. It's a really wonderful conference. They have a fantastic technician track um, with a lot of really advanced information. So just remember that what we're doing here at uh, your your schooling and at Argosy is um, it's just the beginning. It's really just the beginning of your education. Um, you know, I hope that you have a really strong interest in what you're learning. I hope that you have a really um, you know kind of innate curiosity in you know learning about all this information and wanting to do better for your patients that's what continuing education is about um, I'm not gonna get up on a soapbox right now I'll wait till I get back and I'm all excited and energized after being at this conference um, but it, ju it just really it gives you a great um, refresher if you need a refresher in certain topics and it gives you a great um, motivation to keep doing a wonderful job for your patients and, and enjoying the, the field of study that we love so much. So uh, without further ado, we're going to get started on canine infectious diseases. And I'm kind of glad that I'm recording this one because this topic, and again, the feline infectious diseases that we'll cover next, um, these do tend to be a little confusing for people. Um, we're going to learn, uh, we're basically going to focus on the infectious diseases that we protect against with our vaccines. And so part of this process is also going to be um, going over our vaccination protocols. So that will be an important part of what we're covering here today. But we're just going to go ahead and get All right, so this big long list of diseases are what we're going to cover today. Um, the, the diseases that you see here are the ones that we most commonly vaccinate for in this part of the world. There are some other vaccinations that might be given in other parts of the country and other parts of the world, but this is what we're going to focus on is, you know, what you're more likely to see here. Um, so we're going to talk about canine distemper, canine viral hepatitis. Now stop for a second and think what disease or what, sorry, what organ would be affected in canine viral hepatitis? I hope you said liver, because you would be correct. Um, next is parvovirus, and that's a very important infectious disease that we deal with an awful lot in our profession. Then parainfluenza, which sort of sounds like what it causes. Influenza, you know, the um, upper respiratory disease and maybe pneumonia that you might see with a human influenza type. Um, we'll see that with parainfluenza. And we'll talk a little bit about canine influenza later on as well. Um, then there's this condition that we call infectious tracheobronchitis, and that's the, the kind of complex um, that we deal with. There are several diseases that cause that disease, or sorry, several uh, organisms that cause that disease. Um, it's also so, sort of colloquially, colloquially known as kennel cough, and that's certainly easier to say. But tracheobronchitis is descriptive. It tells you exactly where it's happening and what's happening, that there's inflammation in the bronchi and the trachea and it's infectious, spreads from dog to dog. Then we have leptospirosis, which is a bacterial organism, Lyme disease, which is caused by a bacteria, and then finally coronavirus. And so we're going to go through each one of these diseases in um, more detail to kind of tell you what we're preventing for with our vaccinations. All right, first up is canine distemper. And this Im image that you see here in, um, of this uh, lateral projection of a dog, sort of cut down the median plane, um, shows you what organ systems are the most commonly affected by canine distemper. You can see the brain and the spinal cord are highlighted in red at the dorsal aspect of the patient. Then you can see the trachea and the lungs highlighted in red. And then finally, the stomach and the intestinal tract are, you know, towards the caudal end of the patient. Um, so those are the most common areas affected. Um, this, this image should also show the bottoms of the foot pads. Um, those should, that should also be shown, and maybe the nasal passages as well. We'll talk about why. Right. All 
All right, so canine distemper is a very contagious virus of the canine. Um, it also infects, as you can see this by this little image here, um, infects the raccoon as well. Its transmist, uh, transmission is primarily uh, through aerosol, which means through the air. So sneezing and coughing um, from the dog, those particles of the virus go through the air and can be um, inhaled or ingested by another dog. We can also have infective bodily fluids, and that can be nasal discharge, it can be coughed up fluid, um, it can also be diarrhea. Um, and then direct contact, nose-to-nose -nose contact between dogs, or close contact of dogs who live in the same home. So there are different strains that produce different degrees of symptoms and mortality. Some are more severe and some are less severe. Um, the, one of the main things that happens with this virus is that it is immunosuppressive, which means it is suppressing the immune system. And from what we just learned about the immune system, we know that if the immune system is suppressed, it cannot fight off other infections. And what generally tend to uh, develop in dogs that have distemper virus are secondary infections of the respiratory tract and the gastrointestinal or GI tract. Um, so those are secondary infections. This disease can also cause neurologic signs and attack the brain and that's caused directly by the virus getting into the central nervous system. But our respiratory and gastrointestinal side effects are seen, or disease, excuse me, are seen by those secondary infections that develop because the patient is immunosuppressed. Um, if we were to look at this virus under an electron microscope, which we don't have here at this university, they're pretty spendy, so most um, vet schools don't have them or tech schools don't have them. Um, they're usually research facilities. But anyway, if we were to look at these, they actually look really similar to measles and antigenic stimulation of measles virus can cause similar antibodies to form. So re it resembles the measles uh, virus antigenically. The incubation period, which is basically the time from exposure to developing the disease, is anywhere from you know roughly one to three weeks or nine to 18 days. So it can happen, um, it can take a few weeks for the symptoms to develop. Um, and again, this primarily affects the respiratory, gastrointestinal, and central nervous system. Okay, so what are our clinical signs? These images here show um, some really sort of classic clinical signs that we may see in distemper. Um, very often our patients will have a fever and then a leukopenia or low white blood cell count, um, which, you know, you won't always notice right away. I mean, that, and that can be indicative of a lot of different diseases, fever and leukopenia. More specifically, our patients will have conjunctivitis or inflammation of the conjunctiva, rhinitis, inflammation of the nasal passages. They might be coughing. Here's where our respiratory disease is affected. They might also have vomiting and diarrhea. And very often, if you look at these top two pictures of the, the beagle on the left and then the other little puppy on the right, it's hard to tell what breed that is. I'm going to say Akita. Um, but you can see that nasal discharge from both of those dogs. That's sort of um, classic for these, these especially puppies um, that have been exposed to distemper virus. Very often they'll stop eating because their gastrointestinal tract is being damaged um, with secondary bacterial infections. Oh, these guys are dehydrated. You know, they're not eating, they're, they have diarrhea, oftentimes they're vomiting, they feel really crummy, they're not drinking water, so they dehydrate pretty quickly. And again, most of the time these, these are puppies. You know, a lot of our adult dogs either have a, a strong enough immune system to prevent the disease or they've been vaccinated. Um, we'll talk about vaccination in a little bit. Um, but, you know, puppies with their weakened immune systems and, and oftentimes not complete vaccine series, they're just the ones that are most susceptible to this disease. Um, and they get really dehydrated and they feel terrible. 
Um, something that can happen sort of later in the progression of the disease is a skin rash. And then, like I mentioned before, the, having the foot pads be red on that image of all the red areas that are lighting up with the distemper virus. Um, hyperkeratotic foot pads. Sometimes we call that hard pad. So keratin is that protein um, that makes up, you know, in particular hair and nails, but it also makes up the outer coating of the foot pads. And what happens is they get, um, the, those foot pads, the keratin starts to be overproduced. And so the, the pad area on the foot becomes very thickened and firm. And so you can see that in dogs that have distemper. And then kind of the worst part of it is when it gets into the central nervous system. And again, this is direct viral contact in the central nervous system. These dogs can um, have encephalitis or inflammation of the brain and spinal cord. And then that leads to neurologic uh, deficiencies like ataxia, which is stumbling and an inability to be coordinated, blindness. Um, they can have seizures. And sometimes those are referred to as chewing gum seizures because the patient actually it's you know, kind of focal in the face and the head, and it looks like they're chewing gum. Um, that's not a diagnosis for distemper. Dogs with just regular seizures can have chewing gum seizures, but it is something that we can see in these guys. Um, and you know, sometimes the signs can take a long time to get to the uh, central nervous system, although typically you see the respiratory and the um, skin and gastrointestinal signs first, and that's when you start um, you know, trying to, trying to treat these patients and getting them under control. All right, so our treatment for distemper um, would be, I'm going to skip that first bullet and come back to that. So um, ideally, we're going to give antibiotics to treat any of those secondary respiratory and gastrointestinal infections. Because these guys are dehydrated, they need fluids, and very often they need electrolyte replacement. Nutrition, nutrition, nutrition. These guys are not eating. They have vomiting and diarrhea. We need to try and get some food into them, very oftentimes through like a nasogastric tube or something of that nature. And then anti-seizure medication, um, anti-convulsants uh, is another term for that. Um, right, going right back up to the top, it says guarded prognosis. So the prognosis is sort of the... Um, the, the news we give to the owner regarding how well we expect their pet to recover. Um, a good prognosis means our patient will recover very well and should recover entirely. Um, a guarded prognosis means you know, there's a good chance this, this dog may not make it. Um, this is a pretty serious illness and a lot of these dogs die. In fact, the fatality rate primarily by vaccination, and we'll talk about vaccination in just a minute. Um, so luckily, relatively low, um, low frequency of seeing this disease in most practices. So if we're worried about distemper, though, if we have a young dog who's not fully vaccinated, come in to see us, and he's got um, you know, nasal discharge, he's coughing, maybe he's got some vomiting and diarrhea, maybe he has a history of being around other dogs where you know, they're sick now too. Um, you have to ask lots of good questions about, you know, when did they receive their vaccines? How many did they get? If you look at the age of the patient, if they're under 16 weeks of age, you can be pretty sure that they have not had all their vaccines. Um, so these dogs will have a history of no vaccination or an incomplete series. Um, you can do a blood test and look for titers. Now everybody try and think, what, is what do titers measure? Titers measure antibodies and specific antibodies. So we would do a titer for distemper antigen and we would see those titers rising over time which means that if I drew blood sample on this dog today and then I drew another sample on this dog in four weeks those titers would be elevated from where they are today. I don't find that a particularly useful <laughs> diagnostic tool because right now my dog is sick and I need to treat this dog um, for what I think is going on in four weeks. I don't have time to wait for four weeks to see if his titers rose. So that's a little bit academic. Um, it is something that we can do to, to make sure that we, we know it's distemper. The reason why that's important is to help prevent exposure to other animals. Um, and uh, there's also a fluorescent antibody test that can be done on, on tissue. Um, although again, it's not routinely done. Um, we usually, you know, go by clinical signs and history on these guys, treat them, and then if we need to make sure that we know what we're treating, 
um, we'll get uh, we'll get a further diagnosis. Um, however, there's really nothing that we can give to stop this virus. We have to support the animal, get them through this, give them antibiotics to prevent against those secondary infections. Um, but the virus itself, we just have to wait for the immune system to to remove it from the system. There are not a lot of good antiviral drugs that will help with distemper virus. All right, well, let's talk about prevention, prevention, prevention. That is the name of the game in this distemper virus. And really, that's the name of the game in most of these infectious diseases we're going to talk about. Um, we don't want our patients to end up with these, um, especially not distemper. 90% fatality. I mean, Ooh, it's a tough disease to deal with. It's very contagious. Um, so we really need to take our part in educating clients, educating owners, um, and how important this vaccine is to the long-term health of their pet and really the short-term health of their puppy. Um, again, puppies are so much more uh, susceptible to these diseases. The vaccine for distemper is very helpful in controlling the disease. It really is rare to see disease in vaccinated communities. Again, it's usually those uh, shelter situations where you have a lot of puppies come in at once, one of them brings it in, you know, there's not enough time to get them all vaccinated and have that anamnestic response. Remember, it takes about two to four weeks for that to kick in. Um, so that's when they generally see it. This vaccine that we normally use is a modified live vaccine, MLV, um, which means that it's going to stimulate a really good immune response. Um, it's a great vaccine. Now, for puppies who are less than 10 weeks of age and we're worried about a higher level of maternal antibodies, we can actually use um, a canine prepared. You don't want to just grab a human measles vaccine, but a canine specific measles vaccine. Um, and what this is, is again, remember measles and canine distemper look really similar when you're talking about what type of um, uh, immune response or antigenic to antibody response that it develops. And what happens is if you give puppies the measles vaccine, they create antibodies against the measles, which will help prevent, prevent Okay, so next virus to talk about is canine adenovirus. So the name of this virus is adenovirus. The disease that it causes is viral hepatitis. Um, those of us in the veterinary profession, kind of depending on where we were trained and what we learned, may refer to this disease by one or the other. Um, so you may see it referred to as hepatitis, you may see it referred to as adenovirus. It's uh, the same disease, same, same process is going on, just slight, one is the virus name, adenovirus, and then the other is the disease that it causes, which is hepatitis. And you'll see in this image where we have the red highlights, um, the, in the mid-abdomen there, that's the liver, so hepatitis. And then you'll also see a red circle around the eye. This disease also has some effect on uh, the anterior chamber of the eye. Okay, so canine adenovirus type 1, um, sometimes abbreviated CAV1, causes the hepatitis uh, disease, so it causes the liver problems. There's also a uh, canine adenovirus type 2, or CAV2, um, and this particular um, virus is the one that we actually use in the vaccine. Um, there have been older vaccines that were produced with the adenovirus type 1, the unfortunate thing is that they seemed to cause more um, ocular abnormalities and they also seemed to induce uh, the viral infection in the patient. And so the cool thing is, is that the type 2 does not cause disease at the liver or the eye. It only causes disease in the respiratory tract. But the, the immune system creates the right kind of antibodies and the right kind of defenses to recognize that if the type 1 adenovirus gets into the body, the viral um, stimulated immune system from the type 2 goes after the type 1 also. So it's kind of a two for one um, without also the disease, or sorry, the vaccine causing disease in the patient. So to recap, the vaccine contains type 2 two adenovirus that can um, 
the virus can cause uh, upper respiratory illness, but giving that vaccine protects the animal from adenovirus type 1 and type 2. So it's a two for one. It's kind of a nice little thing there. Okay, so this transmission is um, oronasal, meaning that our patients typically um, will cough or sneeze this virus out, and then it will be inhaled by the patient. It takes about four to seven days, so less than a week or right around a week from infection to development of clinical signs. And again, this disease is going to infect primarily the liver. There's that hepatitis. Um, it can affect the kidneys. It can affect the eyes and also the blood vessels. So what are we going to see in our patients? Our clinical signs are, there's some general ones like fever, depression, lethargy. Um, very often we will have a leukopenia and you can see this image right here on the right, um, kind of a representation the uh, little box on the left shows us a high white blood cell count with lots of white blood cells throughout, and that's what you might expect to see through the microscope, and that's a leukocytosis. However, this patient will primarily have leukopenia, or a low white blood cell count. Um, the very specific signs of this disease would be liver disease and failure in severe cases. That severe, um, that severe liver failure and decreased production of those molecules needed for clotting can cause bleeding problems. And um, what we see in this little patient to the right, this little cute little chihuahua, um, if you'll notice there's some icterus there in the sclera of the eye um, from the hepatic disease. Um, these guys are at risk if they have injury or trauma because they can't uh, clot their blood very well. So that could be a really big deal. Um, we can have some other organ issues, particularly with the kidneys in this disease. So our treatment is supportive and symptomatic care. Um, we are going to rehydrate, rehydrate them if they are dehydrated. We're going to treat any secondary infections that develop as a result of that leukopenia. We're going to give our patient drugs that are and, and supplements that will help to support the liver. And we best just basically need to support them through this. Again, this is a virus. We do not have good effective treatments for most viruses. We have to support the, the immune system and support the body as the patient tries to recover. So this can be pretty devastating, um, as you can imagine, to have a, a young animal um, infected with hepatitis, uh, adenovirus, causing hepatitis and uh, lead to liver failure, but it uh, is something that can happen. So of course, prevention, prevention, prevention is key. You know, I'm going to get up on my soapbox for a second. One of the main things that we do when we are in small animal clinical practice is prevent disease to maintain wellness, keep our patients healthy. And um, we're going to learn a lot in the next couple of weeks about how important vaccination is. There are true, sometimes secondary effects of vaccines. There are animals, yes, who have vaccine reactions. But on the massive, massive whole, vaccines are a good and necessary thing for maintaining the health of our patients. So um, you will find that you may have to, um, you know, kind of educate owners uh, a lot about this because there has been a lot of discussion lately about the um, efficacy and perhaps the secondary side effects of vaccinations. But I am um, wholeheartedly in favor of vaccinations as wellness care and also as disease prevention. I think the, the benefits far, far, far outweigh the risks um, for most patients. And then, you know, we'll have our individuals who have severe reactions that we'll have to take different approaches to, but vaccines, vaccines, vaccines for everybody. Um, so let's talk about this vaccine. Okay, remember we talked about the canine adenovirus, CAV. Um, uh, type 2 is the one that's going to be in the vaccine, and that is very safe and effective. Um, it is a modified live vaccine, again, 
And it is um, a, such a commonly administered vaccine that this disease is pretty rare. Um, I, to my knowledge, have never seen a case of viral hepatitis in my 15 years of practice, which I am very happy to have not seen it. Um, I personally I have also not yet seen a case of canine distemper in practice. Um, I know that there was not that long ago a pretty significant outbreak of canine distemper in uh, Chicago um, in, in animal shelters, um, but I don't think it made its way into Minnesota or, um, in, or Iowa where I was at the time. Okay, so we are starting big with talking about canine infectious diseases. Um, first, distemper, really big and bad, causing respiratory, gastrointestinal, and central nervous system signs, 90% mortality. Um, the mortality is a little bit lower on the um, viral hepatitis. I would say it's probably in the 50 to 70% range. Um, but again, a very, very serious illness. Um, the kind of third most serious illness, and, and I, get, I can't really rate them um, in order of one, two, three, but another serious illness would be parvovirus. Canine parvovirus you will see in practice. You might not see distemper, you might not see viral hepatitis, but you will see parvovirus. It is in, in, in just in incredibly infectious. Um, and it is the one we have the hardest time with when it comes to um, maternal antibody interference with vaccine. And we also have some considerations for particular breeds when it comes to parvovirus. Um, but you're going to see this and kind of depending on where you live and um, what your uh, vaccination frequency is with your clientele, you may see this more or less often. Um, but it is a nasty, nasty disease. So take a look at our picture here. We've got um, a bright red heart. Parvovirus can infect the heart and cause um, cardiovascular disease. That's a little bit lower on the, the frequency list, but it is something that can happen. And then if you look going further caudally, we've got the stomach and the small intestines. That's really where parvovirus does its, um, its biggest damage. Um, and then finally, I've got a red arrow there pointing to the femur of this dog. That's to remind me to tell you that this disease also affects the bone marrow um, and affects it pretty tragically. Um, so we're going to talk about this nasty disease. I'm being very dramatic here, I, think, I feel, but I, like, I just hate this disease so much. And I've seen it be very devastating to my patients. So um, it's super important disease. All right, well, let's talk about this nasty bug a little bit more. Um, over there on the right at the bottom is a, a electron micrograph of the virus, and that's just kind of what it looks like. It looks pretty innocuous, no big deal, just a bunch of little circles. Well, it's a jerk. It's a jerk of a virus. It's very common. It's, um, it's in the environment a lot. This disease was not known about really before 1978, so uh, a long time before many, many, many of you guys were born, um, but not before I was born. And it has mutated several times since that, that time. I remember when I was a kid um, and in the 80s, and uh, parvovirus was kind of a new and emerging disease. The vaccine had just been created, and it was really... Or right now. We'll talk about it right now. Oh, look at this sad Saluki puppy. So if you look at this, this image, and this will give you kind of an indication of what these dogs may look like coming in. They're going to be real depressed and lethargic and very often have uh, bloody diarrhea and vomit. Uh, let's talk about this, this nasty virus. So these patients um, generally will come in contact with the virus, and it will only take about three to five days for that virus to enter the intestinal tract and then start to replicate in the bloodstream and in the intestinal tract. It then only takes four to five days um, from infection for that puppy to, or dog to be infective or to be able to infect other animals. And this is another reason why we see this disease so much more commonly, is in that first four to five days, 
those dogs aren't going to start to show clinical signs right away. And so your puppy could have come in contact with parvo four days ago, and now it's shedding that parvovirus in its feces, infecting another puppy. And he, your dog might not get sick for three or four more days, and you don't even know. It's a, it's a really sad thing. Um, and then also at about four to five days, it's gonna, this virus is going to enter the bone marrow. And the intestinal tract of the bone marrow is where this virus does its worst. So we're going to talk about that next. Okay, so here's the life cycle of parvovirus, and I borrowed this from um, another presentation. Um, so if you look there at on the left side where you see number one, that's our carrier dog excreting parvovirus in its feces. Um, and so what happens there is that this dog is, um, has parvovirus in its intestinal tract, and it's, it may be sick, it may not yet be sick yet, but it uh, passes stool, and in the fecal matter are all those viruses. Um, another dog comes along, and he may come along immediately, or he may come along weeks or sometimes even months later, um, and ingests the virus. Maybe he ingests the whole bit of poop. This is why dogs eating poop is bad for lots of reasons. Um, so this other dog comes along. Um, step three, the parvo is going to multiply in the dog's intestine and the bone marrow, and then that dog becomes a parvo carrier. Now, he can make another dog sick and another dog sick. So this is just a vicious cycle sometimes. These guys get sick with parvo. You can see him stuck in his little bed there, feeling very bad. And if treatment is successful, then he'll go on to live a normal, healthy life. But sometimes treatment is not successful. These guys can be really, really sick, and this can be a really serious disease. All right, so here's the sad part. Let's talk about clinical signs. Some standard generalized clinical signs of lethargy, fever, leukopenia. So those are, are pretty common and again, really not specific. The next two, vomiting and bloody diarrhea, are very specific to this particular disease. What happens is this virus really likes rapidly dividing cells. So cells that divide rapidly are um, in, on, along the lining of the villi in the intestine. And up there in the upper right uh, corner, you can see kind of a cross-section of villi. And if you remember back to comparative anatomy, when we were talking about um, how the intestinal tract is set up, specifically the small intestine. So there are all these little folds, 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 folds throughout the entire small intestine. And it's basically these little finger-like projections that are folds of the mucosa that increase the surface area so that there can be lots of digestion and absorption of nutrients happening within the small intestine. Well, all those little folds have tiny, tiny, tiny little cells that line them. And what happens with parvo is parvo gets down into those cells, into those cells that line the villi of the small intestine, and it destroys them. So now instead of this very, 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 you know, like all of this extra surface area on the inside lining of the small intestine, we have just, it's wiped out. So we have a smaller surface from which to absorb nutrients. Nutrients do not get absorbed properly. They don't get absor uh, digested properly either. And our patient starts to have severe diarrhea very, very often with blood. And the reason there's blood is because as those cells are destroyed, it exposes the underlying vasculature. And if you look at that picture, you can see um, the, the picture of the villi that there is, you know, a little arterial um, capillary and then a, a venous capillary that go into each individual villus. So as those cells get killed, those little pink cells all, over, all the way around, as those get killed, the villus is exposed. All those villi are exposed to uh, the ingested food coming in, and that's basically, they're just kind of destroyed and wiped out. And that exposes those blood vessels and we get bleeding. Uh, these pets will often vomit as a result of this trauma that's happening in their gastrointestinal tract. Uh, sometimes the vomit will have blood in it, sometimes it won't. Um, but very, very often the stool will, or the diarrhea that comes next. Because these guys are vomiting and having diarrhea, they will become anorexic. They don't want to eat. 
Um, and then the worst part of this disease, as far as uh, the body is concerned, is the dehydration. They're not absorbing fluids very well from their gastrointestinal tract. They're vomiting. They're getting rid of lots of fluid, um, and they're not being able to take any in. Puppies, again, you know, just like their immune systems are, you know, tender and weak and not really able to support their, you know, their whole body at this stage, um, they very quickly will succumb to dehydration. And so that, these are all terrible clinical signs. I mean, that Jack Russell puppy that you see um, at the top of the page there, that is a very sick puppy, and you see that a lot, especially the small breeds. It seems like these smaller guys, when they come in, they just, it just hits them harder. Um, that, that lab puppy down in the corner has a little bit better look to her than the, the Jack Russell does. And, you know, she just has a, a little bit more reserve. She's got a little bit more body fat. She's got a little bit more self <laughs> to uh, protect from the massive dehydration that occurs if this disease isn't treated right away. Um, okay, so sad, sad stuff here. Um, but let's make sure that we talk about the bottom point. This disease has a higher incidence in certain breeds. Those breeds are Rottweilers, Dobermans, and Pitbulls. Rotties and Dobies, we kind of, you know, they're black and tan, and so very often it's like the black and tan dogs. Um, but, you know, several years ago it was identified that pit bulls fall in this category as well. Um, and that has to do with maternal antibody interference. These guys seem to hang on to their maternal antibodies a little bit longer than do, you know, the other average breeds. So we do extend out vaccination protocols for this virus for those breeds in particular. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Okay, well, let's talk about how we diagnose this, these four patients. Um, so very often um, you will see a leukopenia. And if you combine the leukopenia with the other clinical signs of vomiting and diarrhea, um, you know, you, you pretty much will know what you're dealing with. Um, but you really should get a confirmatory test um, because it really matters to um, your, your patient and how to deal with them, hopefully once they get better, and how to prevent, you know, just to make sure that you're preventing them from being um, infecting other animals. They do shed this virus for a long time, even after they get clinically better. So it's important to know for sure that they have, that they have parvo or not. So there's an ELISA test. Um, that tests specifically for the parvovirus antigen. So remember, antigen is the actual disease-causing organism. And so this particular um, test here on the left is going to uh, test for the actual parvovirus within the sample. Typically, we use a fecal sample for this. All right, so let's talk about treatment. So it's really important that these dogs be in an isolation ward. I've talked a lot about how contagious this is and how hardy the virus is. And so it's really, really important that these dogs not be out in the general population and that they certainly, um, they certainly don't use the room that they were in, the exam room that they were in, or any surfaces that they were on for any other puppies um, until that area has been thoroughly disinfected. Um, so we need to keep them in an isolation ward. Many, many clinics do have a separate, separate space in the clinic um, for just these types of cases, patients that are really contagious. Um, but not every clinic does. And so you have to you know, consider that. And that's something that your, your doctor and the team will have to come up with is how to manage these cases. Um, if you have the capability to isolate these dogs, then it's important to do so. Um, the downside of isolation is that very often, you know, the isolation is sort of off the main floor, um, and uh, these are pretty critical dogs sometimes, so you have to maintain a, a good, you know, um, monitoring on them. Sometimes people will set up all those little video baby monitors in the isolation ward to keep an eye on those patients, um, but it's pretty important that you keep them away from the general population in order to protect the rest of the hospital. So fluids, this is the most important thing um, of any of the treatments. Um, I think if you, you know, had to get rid of one treatment, or if you had to get rid of any treatments, the last one I would get rid of was fluids. And that's because these dogs are so dehydrated. Um, so we want ideally to give these guys intravenous fluids. 
um, through an IV catheter. In very small patients, we might actually have to place that catheter in the uh, interosseous space or directly into the bone. Um, and then we also want to replace electrolytes. So remember from last week um, that uh, electrolyte loss with vomiting and diarrhea, we can lose potassium, sodium, and chloride. So we want to replace that with our fluid therapy. And then sometimes these dogs are hypoglycemic. Remember, they're puppies, and so their livers are not fully formed. Well, they're fully formed, but they're not fully functional, and so they may not be making enough of their own blood sugar. They're also vomiting, and they're not eating. And so they're not taking in any new uh, sources of sugar. So um, they can get hypoglycemic pretty quickly. So we want to supplement with dextrose if possible, or if necessary, excuse me. Antibiotics for secondary infections. So remember the All right, look at those sad guys. So I found this picture, I really liked it because it's a Rottweiler. And at the top in that Rottie is to remind you, um, remember that our Rotties and Dobermans are black and tan dogs. And pit bulls, don't forget those guys, are especially susceptible to parvovirus, um, primarily because of their very active maternal antibodies. So um, some more notes on treatment for these guys. Um, sometimes we'll use plasma transfusions to help maintain the blood pressure and replace the proteins that are lost in the diarrhea and the vomiting. Um, dehydration in general will tend to lower blood pressure just because of the total volume of blood circulating, the volume of fluid in the uh, bloodstream is lower and that's, going to, that's called hypovolemia and that's going to cause lower blood pressure or hypotension. Plasma is a large protein and another term we use for that is called colloid. So, you know, when we're talking about different types of fluids to give, some are very um, water-based, which we refer to as crystalloids. Um, fluids that have a lot of protein in them, one is called one is plasma, and that's a colloid. Um, this large protein will stay in the blood, blood vessels. It won't leak out into the... Um, subcutaneous space or the extracellular space. And remember, fluid likes to follow solids. And so the fluid from around the cells or the fluid in the subcutaneous space will actually then go into the bloodstream and that will help to bring up the blood pressure. And those really should only be used after your patient is fully hydrated. And the doctor will make these decisions, of course, but it's important to know why we use Okay, so let's talk about preventing this terrible illness because I don't want to see it. Um, so our vaccine. The vaccine is very safe, very effective, but it's not 100% effective. Um, it's close, but it's not 100%. Um, and that's with any vaccine, you know, you can't rely completely on Okay, so we're going to stop there. We'll start up with infectious tracheobronchitis um, when we're live again in class. Um, so please review the three vaccine, or excuse me, the three viruses that we talked about: canine distemper virus, um, adenovirus or viral hepatitis, and parvovirus. Those are the three big uh, sort of big guns when it comes to um, the diseases that we will be covering in this class. Uh, we're going to talk about the less scary diseases uh, when I get back next week. Hope you guys are having a great week. I hope the exam went well for you. And um, I will see you next Thursday. All right, take care. Bye-bye.